Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our virtual event, The Twenties, A Decade of Revolution and Reaction. My name is Rachel Taylor and I'm a programming librarian here at the Scranton Library. And tonight we are very pleased to welcome as our guest speaker, Dr. Stephen McGrath, Professor Emeritus of History at CCSU. Um, and through his talk this evening, he will explore how um, the 1920s was a decade of paradox. It was a revolution in manners and morals that affected everyone in America, as well as an era of movements and reactions that um, changed our culture forever. I do ask that everyone please remain muted until the end of the talk. If you have a question before then, you are more than welcome to enter it into the group chat and Stephen will address it when he is able. So thank you so much to Stephen for being with us tonight. And without here, further ado, here is a decade of revolution and reaction. Well, Rachel, it's a real pleasure to be here with, with all of you tonight. And I thank you for inviting me. The session uh, is entitled The Twenties Revolution and Reaction. And you might want to start asking ourselves, uh, what kind of revolution are we talking about? We know all about the American Revolution, and we know that some folks refer to the Civil War as the Second American Revolution, but hardly ever do we have the 1920s referred to as a revolution. Well, it was. And every revolution produ produces some kind of reaction. And so there was a reaction to this revolution as well. And in many ways, that decade was not unlike our own times. And we might explore that connection uh, after the lecture is finished. Well, let's start out with the revolution. In 1920, the United States was a very Victorian society. There was a very strict code of manners and morals. Women wore uh, dresses down to their ankles. Women wore bodices that were buttoned up completely. It was straight, proper, and predictable. That was Victorian America. But by 1930, the whole picture had changed. No longer was the moral code of 1920 uh, in effect. It had changed. No longer did women wear skirts that were all the way down to their ankles. No longer were women so buttoned up as they had been in the Victorian era. Many things had changed and we want to explore those changes. And of course, in every era, there are people who are profoundly uncomfortable with change. And that of course provoked a reaction and we'll explore something of the reaction too. So what happened? What caused this revolution in manners and morals? Well, a lot of it had to do with the men returning from World War I and the live for today attitude that many returned with. They had been raised in Victorian America, many of them raised on farms or in ethnic urban communities that were very strict and straight-laced but they'd been to France. They'd interacted with French women and they were accustomed to things uh, in France that were very different from the United States. There was a, a great song after World War I, 1919. And the title of it was, How You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? And that was a real question. Once these farm boys and factory boys had been exposed to uh, the larger world, would they ever go back to living the lives they had uh, before the war? And the answer was no. The men were profoundly disillusioned with their participation in the war. F. Scott Fitzgerald summed up the spirit of the age when he said, we found that all, all gods dead, all wars fought, all faiths in men shaken. Many vets were angry. They felt that they had been duped into fighting a war for the rich. And the whole idea of spread eagle patriotism 
that had emerged during the war had seriously eroded and it eroded first among the troops. Now the second reason for the uh, revolution in manners and morals was a gradual but profound change in the status of women. Women got the vote in 1920 as a result of the 19th Amendment. In fact, my grandmother and great-grandmother voted on the same day for the first time. And they got that vote largely because they had contributed so heavily to the war effort. They had gone into the factories and replaced the men. And because they'd done that, and because they were the sort of the antecedents of Rosie the Riveter in World War II, they re were rewarded with the vote. Now, what that brought was greater autonomy for women in the 1920s. If women now could make up their own minds about political affairs, then certainly they're going to want to have their say in a lot of other things as well. There were lots of household inventions in the 1920s. Vacuum cleaners, waffle irons, uh, toasters, all sorts of things that made housework a whole lot easier than it had been before. And so women began to take jobs, often part-time jobs, and got themselves into the economy. The men worked in the factories, as they had before the war, and the women began to work in shops and offices. In the early 20s, there was a proliferation of secretarial and business schools, primarily for women. Now, what this did was it gave women some economic autonomy. And with that economic autonomy, they were less willing to put up with abusive husbands. They could now defy them. And between 1920 and 1930, the divorce rate, which had been fairly low, doubled. Clearly, women were not going to accept the subordinate position that they had been in in 1917. Times had changed. Now, the third factor in bringing about the revolution in manners and morals was changes in mass communications. First of all, the radio. The first radio broadcast was a broadcast of the election returns in 1920 by station KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that station is still around. Motion pictures emerged during the 1920s on a much larger scale than they ever had before. The first motion picture had emerged in 1915. It was made by D.W. Griffith, and the title of it was Birth of a Nation. It was a terribly racist film based on a novel uh, entitled The Klansman, and uh, it, it lauded uh, the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist organizations. It was a silent film. The first talkie, the first um, talking film, was actually made in 1929. It starred Al Jolson. It was called The Jazz Singer. So in 15 years, the movies had progressed from the, the, the silent movies all the way to the talkies in 1929. Now, what that also meant that for the first time, in American history, you had movie stars and the scandalous lives of movie stars were laid bare, so to speak, in the 1920s. Um, these movie stars became role models for rebellions adolescents. Movie magazines emerged in the 1920s and they exploited this. Ministers invade against the movie magazines and the damage it was doing to the youth of America. 
But nevertheless, the young people continued to read the movie magazines and continued to lionize these new movie stars, uh, despite the fact that many of the lives they led were downright scandalous and never would have been permitted to be aired in public before 1920. The fourth factor here is transportation, the automobile. Changes in transportation not only led to faster communication and faster shipment of goods, but it also led to changes in manners and morals as well. And that came with the automobile, the cheap Model T. Henry Ford, who was a very eccentric man in many ways, but brilliant as an entrepreneur, thought that if you paid someone a living wage, they'd be able to afford the car you produced. Now, the Model T, which was the, uh, the car of the people in America, uh, really gave to American families a lot more mobility than they'd ever had before. Generally, you weren't born and lived and died within a radius of about 40 miles anymore. You could go farther. Many families began to take family vacations, motels, cabins, and other kinds of accommodations emerged so that many more Americans could take advantage of the vacation. Now, many people actually bought cars rather than other types of necessity, things we would consider necessities. Someone asked a farmer one time, why do you have a Model T if you don't have a bathtub? And his response was simply, well, you can't go to town in a bathtub. Needless to say, the automobile radically changed dating and courting practices of young people. The rumble seat, the back seat, became infamous in the 1920s, and children could date without being surveyed constantly by their parents. Generally, people courted uh, before 1920 on the front porch. They'd sit on the front porch and meet and sit in a mutual kind of double-seater rocker or something, and uh, the light would be on, and dad and mom would be right there in the, in the parlor right in back of them. So uh, they, were, uh, they had an incentive to keep everything on the straight and narrow. But once the automobile came around and it provided autonomy from the parents, well, that was a whole different story. Adolescence also became, for the first time in American history, a real functional concept. Generally, most young people had gone from being children to adulthood in a very short amount of time. Before 1920, there really was no stage in one's life that was termed adolescence. But in the 1920s, this adolescence came about. Part of it was due to the automobile. Part of it was due to the fact that more people were staying in high school, especially girls. It was not uncommon throughout the 1920s to have the preponderance of high school students, uh, girls, and to have the valedictorian and the salutatorian and the essayist, all the top students, girls. Why? Because the girls were now training to be secretaries, accountants, various types of assistants. Uh, and we had mentioned before that there was a proliferation of training schools for girls after high school. And uh, many girls took advantage of this uh, who had not taken advantage of this before. This was much more popularly spread. Generally, education after high school was reserved for rich children. 
you had the four few four year colleges, women's colleges. You had uh, some junior colleges, which were really preparation more for an MRS than they were for uh, a BA. And then you had the vocational or trade schools where women learned to be accountants or uh, to uh, comptometer operators or something else related to business. But the point here is that women got into the workforce. They had been in the workforce in the war. They had been there as factory workers, but these were clean jobs. You didn't have to get your hands all dirty and greasy anymore. And women were needed with the expanding economy of the 1920s. Now, <clears throat> so this is a time where adolescence comes into play, where we see uh, Chip meeting Muffy down at the malt shop. And most students had some high school, many, many girls graduated from high school, and it began to be more of a trend among boys as well. Now, the fifth factor in changing manners and morals in the 1920s was the violation of prohibition and the emergence of organized crime. Prohibition had been legislated during the First World War as a war measure, and it was called the Volstead Act. And it was incorporated into the 18th Amendment in the Constitution in 1919. And this amendment prohibited the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages for non-sacramental purposes. So if you were a church, an Episcopal or an Orthodox or a uh, Roman Catholic church, you could still get the wine. If you were Jewish, you could get a note from the rabbi to pick up the wine. Anybody who had stores of liquor um, before the passage of an amendment were allowed to use it. So people bought huge quantities of liquor before the amendment was passed, so they would be generously supplied for most of the 1920s. Now, the prohibition was basically something pushed by women, and this was a part of the success of the women's movement to get prohibition through, um, to, to curtail the activities of their uh, abusive husbands. It was also something pushed by low church Protestants, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, who had gone to using um, grape juice in their communion services in the 1840s and 50s, and who saw that prohibition was a way to control the unruly immigrants, such as the Irish and Germans, who really uh, enjoyed imbibing in, uh, in the oil. Now, prohibition was violated on a wide scale. In the rural areas, it seemed to be enforced a little bit better than in the cities. But in the cities, especially those cities that had access to transportation from Canada, the law was widely violated. There were also the making of home liquor, bathtub gin, wine, beer. The runners from Canada went through Chicago and from there all through the rest of the United States by rail because uh, Chicago, of course, was a rail hub. And this is why Chicago was so important uh, in the 1920s. Al Capone raised a gang in uh, Chicago in the 1920s inherited Danny Florio's gang. And this gang went into conflict against the Irish gang, the O'Banions. And Al Capone's gang wiped out the O'Banions in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre on February 17th, 1929. So one thing you see here is, is the emergence of organized crime 
that never ran really an organized crime in America before the 1920s. There had been financial conspiracies and things of that sort, but they mostly involved people who had money already and people who were part of the ruling class. This was different. This involved the immigrants, especially the uh, Irish and Italians, and to some extent, Jewish people as well. And in the 1920s, these groups made, these uh, organizations uh, made tremendous amounts of money. And of course, when prohibition was repealed in 1933, they simply laundered this money into other types of businesses. And that has really continued right down to today. The gangsters were often seen as heroes. And this is, this is where the, the, the culture really changes. The gangsters were seen as heroes. And Al Capone received literally thousands of marriage proposals from women all over the United States. In Chicago, between 1927 and 1930, there were over 500 gang-related killings. Now, as I said, prohibition had ended in 1933, but the damage had been done. And organized crime was a fixed part of the American social, cultural, and economic landscape uh, right down to today. Another important factor here in uh, the changing manners and morals of the 1920s was modernization in religion and reaction against it. In the 1920s, the major Protestant denominations like, oh, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, uh, and others fought the uh, battles of uh, fundamentalists versus modernists. Perhaps the greatest modernist preacher of the 1920s was Harry Emerson Fawcett at the Riverside Church in New York City, which John D. Rockefeller had built especially for Fosdick. And Fosdick, um, did not adhere to a literal interpretation of the Bible. He believed that the Bible was a series of stories meant to tell divine truth, but not uh, a history book, not an accurate recounting of history. These were stories and they told theological, not existential truths. On the other hand, Fosdick and the modernists were opposed by more evangelical uh, uh, folks like uh, Billy Sunday. And fundamentalists adhered to a very rigid, literal interpretation of the Bible. This also set up something of a split between rural and urban areas. The urban areas tended to have a more liberal religion and the rural areas tended to want to stick with the old time religion of fundamentalism. Liberal religion was strongest in the North and in the upper Midwest and fundamentalism was strongest in the South and lower mid Midwest. And that continues to be the situation today. Now in literature, the writers of this era have often been turned the lost generation. And the reason why is that many of the writers of this era were turned off on the United States of America. They saw American society as crass, materialistic, and intellectually shallow. And the novelists of this era wrote novels to lampoon the values of 
uh, Americans and their political leaders. Sinclair Lewis, for example, wrote some of the greatest indictments of American life with his novels, Babbitt, Main Street, and his legendary uh, skewering of evangelists, the novel Elmer Dantry. F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, The Side of Paradise, Tender is the Night, wrote about upper class wastrels who, who wasted away their lives in idleness and dissipation while the rest of America simply uh, got by. The poet T.S. Eliot, after the First World War, produced his monumental poem, The Wasteland. And of course, he could have written the same poem again after World War II. H.L. Mencken was the editor of the American Mercury. And he lived in Baltimore. American Mercury is pu published there. And he was the bad boy of American literature in the 1920s. He was a relentless critic of the American population. He called them the bourgeoisie. He was a relentless critic of Republican presidents in the 1920s, starting with Warren G. Harding. I want to read you a section from uh, Mencken's writing. You may have run into it at some point when you were in school, but um, it's inevitable. There's, we've never had someone of Mencken's character since. And he's talking about uh, Warren G. Harding and his rhetoric, and he writes as follows. He, meaning Harding, takes the first place in my Valhalla of literati. That is to say, he writes the worst English I have ever encountered. It reminds me of a string of wet sponges. It reminds me of tattered washing on the line. It reminds me of stale bean soup, of college yells, of dogs barking idiotically through the endless night. It is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. It drags itself out of the dark abysm, I was about to say abscess, of pish and crawls insanely to the topmost pinnacle of posh. It is rumble and bumble. It is flap and doodle. It is balder and dash. So there's more I can read to you about that, but needless to say, Warren G. Harding didn't have a very high estimation of Warren G. H.L. Uh, uh, Megan did not have a very high estimation of Warren G. Harding, and he didn't have a very high estimation of the American people who elected him either. So the literature of the 1920s was a very alienated literature. It was a literature of protest, but uh, it was not protest in favor of a radical change because the uh, writers of the 20s really didn't have a program. They were simply indicting society for the faults that they perceived it to have. Now, of course, there was a reaction. And the second part of this lecture is about the reaction against the changes in the 1920s. And just like in our own time, there is a strong reaction against the changes that have taken place over the last 30 years or so uh, culturally, there was this reaction in the 20s as well. The reaction against the changes in manners and morals of the 1920s actually had its roots in the war era. During the war, socialists and communists had opposed American entrance into the conflict. Professors were often forced out of their departments or were fired. The famous historians, uh, Charles Beard and A.J. Muzzy, 
were forced out of their jobs at Columbia University, for example. At the end of the war, there was a great concern about anarchists and reds or communists. And Wilson's Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, uh, backed a series of raids on radicals and suspected reds, uh, rounded them up, and many were deported. The anarchists responded with a lot of violence, targeting very visible targets. Um, they even bombed the uh, Morgan Bank in New York City. And that's a subject of a wonderful book by uh, uh, Professor Gage at Yale, The Day Wall Street Exploded. Now, not everybody in America was happy with the progress made by women. Then and now we have our reactions against uh, the women's movement. Remember the women had gained the vote in 1920, but some women led by Alice Paul continued to campaign for an equal rights amendment. They thought that the vote was not enough there had to be an equal rights amendment to the United States Constitution in order to make equality full. Alice Paul actually formed the National Women's Party that was very active in the 1920s, but they were never able to get any legislatures to approve it, and it was not added to the United States Constitution and it still isn't. Interestingly enough, Japan has an equal rights for women provision in its constitution. And it was put there after World War II when General Douglas MacArthur composed the new Japanese con uh, constitution. But the United States doesn't have one. Blocked, of course, largely by the predictable suspects the South and the Midwest. Another factor in the reaction against uh, uh, the changes in morals and manners and morals was uh, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. In the 19, uh, early part of the ni ni uh, uh, 1900s, large numbers of people from foreign countries came to the United States. And many of these people came from countries that had historically had very low emigration to the United States. Whereas before 1880, most of the immigrants had been English, Irish, Scottish, oh, Norwegian, Swedish, uh, uh, Northern Europeans. All of a sudden, large numbers of Southern and Eastern Europeans became, uh, came to the United States, Poles, Czechs, uh, Ruthenians, Russians, um, Italians, Greeks, uh, Spaniards, Lebanese, uh, Syrians, all sorts of folks came to the United States for many, many reasons. Some were fearing religious persecution. Some um, were trying to gain some kind of economic opportunity. Some were facing famine and shortage in their own lands. And some, like the Eastern Europeans uh, uh, in, the, in the Russian Empire, were fleeing the Russian draft uh, for the Russia-Japanese War in 1905. So there were many, many reasons why this very different group came to America. Now, they were also different in the sense that most of them were either Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, including those from the Middle East. And uh, that was viewed with great alarm by the native white Anglo-Saxon Protestant population. Henry Cabot Lodge wanted to keep them out. He thought, well, Americans have never, they've never really mixed with uh, these kinds of people and they are incapable of uh, 
uh, becoming good citizens in the American sense of the word. So we ought to at least have a literacy test if we don't exclude them completely. The Ku Klux Klan revived itself at Stone Mountain in uh, Georgia in 1915 in the aftermath of D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation. But this time, the Ku Klux Klan had some new dimensions to it. It was not only opposed to, to Negroes, it was opposed to Jews and Catholics and anybody basically from Eastern or Southern Europe. So for example, Italians were forced to sit on the back of the trains in the South. There were actually anti-Italian riots in several places in the South, most notably New Orleans. The Ku Klux Klan was also very popular in the North. Even in Connecticut, in many of the major cities, there were Ku Klux Klan rallies and parades uh, in some of the major cities in Connecticut. My father, as a child, saw one. Manchester was a real center of Ku Klux Klan activity. Many of the men who worked in the Cheney Mills were in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, they demonstrated for many years. The state of Indiana was virtually ruled by the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Now the Klan, uh, reached its peak in the late 1920s, and suddenly it was beset by scandal. The grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana was traveling on a train with his girlfriend, and apparently there was some altercation, and she tried to drink something akin to Babo or Drano, and uh, as a result, of course, was a disaster, and, uh, and naturally the blame fell on him, uh, which it should have, and uh, people began to see the Klan for what it was, a terrorist organization, something that was fundamentally anti-American. But in the 1920s also, some of the oppressed minorities stood together. For example, the Knights of Columbus undertook a campaign to eradicate anti-German prejudice. There's a great deal of prejudice against Germans in World War I. And the Knights of Columbus undertook a campaign to change that, to change Americans' opinions of Germans. Germans were not the only group that the Knights of Columbus helped. The uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous black scholar, published his work, uh, The Souls of Black Folk, through the Knights of Columbus. The Knights, like many others, saw that there was common cause to be made with other groups that were facing oppression. The American Civil Liberties Union was formed in the 1920s in order to combat anti-Semitism, especially in the aftermath of the lynching in the South of a Jewish man who owned a hardware store, Leo Frank. And of course, the, natural, the American Civil Liberties Union continues to defend American liberties to today. <clears throat> there was widespread discrimination against African Americans. There were signs that simply read N-I-N-A, no Irish need apply. But all of this stimulated ethnic pride among some of these targeted groups, something that the, uh, the natives hadn't really expected. Ethnic churches and associations flourished in the 1920s as people began to turn in and to try to take some pride in their ethnic ancestry. Now, the, on the national level, Congresses of that time, the Republican Congresses, passed a series of anti-immigrant laws, beginning in 1922, to restrict immigration 
All these laws culminated in the National Origins Quota Act of 1924. That set a limit of about 150,000 immigrants to come in annually. And it provided that the uh, 150,000 would be composed of the same percentage that a particular ethnic group constituted in the American population in 1890, for example. Italians were 2% of the American population in 1890. So according to the new law, Italians could constitute 2% of that 150,000, which is about 3,000 people. So the whole aim of this law was to restrict the immigration of Eastern and Southern Europeans and Mediterraneans, restrict the, imitation, the, the immigration of all these Roman Catholics and Jews, and try to maintain some kind of Protestant purity here in the United States. Asians were shut out entirely. Despite a gentleman's agreement with Japan in 1907, worked out by, with, with uh, President Roosevelt, uh, Asians were shut out entirely in 1924. That only changed in 1965. When at the behest of Lyndon B. Johnson, American immigration policy was drastically re re revised and America was more open to a diverse group of people, many of whom had never come to America before, such as South Asians. As you know, we have a large population of South Asians now. They had never been among the large numbers of those who came to America before 1965, but they are now. And that's largely due to a change in that law. Now, there was also a reaction against modernism in science. Along with the reaction against modernism in religion, fundamentalism versus modernism, there was a reaction against modernism in science. And this was shown in the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee. Now, a number of states in the South, of course, passed laws to outlaw the teaching of Darwin's theory of natural selection, otherwise popularly known as the theory of evolution. And one young biology teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, decided to test that law. And he taught the theory of natural selection and he was suitably fired. Now, this culminated in a trial, a historic trial, it was called the Scopes trial after John Scopes, that young biology teacher, where Clarence Darrow represented uh, Scopes and William Jennings Bryan, three-time presidential candidate, represented uh, the school board and argued for uh, uh, the, the anti-evolutionary position. Well, this trial did nothing but expose the uh, forces arrayed against evolution as backward, as anti-scientific. And fundamentalism came into great disrepute among the educated classes of Americans because of their anti-scientific posture. Uh, now, what we have here in the 1920s then is some profound changes and shifts in American manners and morals, largely occasioned by participation in the First World War. War changes every society. And World War I had dramatic and far-reaching changes for America. The idea of Michael Kamen, the great historian, who wrote the book, People of Paradox, 
certainly true for the 1920s, that Americans are a people of paradox. On the one hand, we can be very open-minded, very liberal, very much in favor of change. But on the other hand, we can be very afraid of change and closed and reactionary. On the one hand, we can see the growth of freedom in colonial America. But along with that growth of freedom is the twisted vine of slavery that grows simultaneously. So we are in many ways a people of paradox. And the 1920s showed that very well. 